My name is Lane McClelland. I'm the director at the Crossroads Community Engagement Center here at the University of Alabama. Uh, I first met Ilham Ali when she was a freshman, and she was introduced to me as uh, the faculty advi I'm the faculty advisor for Thai Talks, and Ilham was a new person starting to take over the technical role, I believe. After that, I continued to encounter Ilham in many uh, worlds here on campus. She um, was very involved with our Sustained Dialogue Moderator program. She also uh, happened to be a student in my husband's sustainability course. Um, and then she uh, worked with us on a very important pilot project we did called Political Dialogues at UA. What I've learned about Ilham is that she's always learning and she's always reflecting and trying to understand new, the nuances of life and also what it means to listen better and make this world better. I give you Ilham Ali. Hello everyone, and thank you, Lane, for the introduction. So as she said, my name is Ilham Ali, and I'm a senior here at the University of Alabama. So today I'm gonna to talk about a topic that's really close to my heart, and it's called Space Technologies and Opportunity for Justice and Development. So just a little bit about me. I'm a first-generation Sudanese American. I grew up for most of my life in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. It's a small town in the northwest corner of the state, and we're known for our music. We have a little documentary on Netflix that we're very proud of. It's called Muscle Shoals, so you should watch it. I'm studying environmental engineering here, and I have minors in public policy and computer-based honors. And this summer, I had the really amazing opportunity to research at the MIT Media Lab in a group called Space Enabled. And the mission of this group was to advance justice in Earth's complex systems using designs enabled by space. And so I learned a lot through this experience and was able to grow um, in both my technical experience but also in a social aspect and to start to think a lot more critically about what the impact of technology is on the communities that we're a part of and the communities that we hope to serve. So the main thesis here is that space technology supports the global development goals. These are the UN Sustainable Development Goals that were set out and agreed upon by 193 nations. So these are 17 sets of measurable targets and indicators about how we can make the world a better place for everyone. So they include things like no poverty, no hunger, sustainable cities, and sustainable communities. So how does space technology help us get closer to achieving the world that we hope to have? So there are several space technologies that are really important in this. One of them are the satellite missions. There are dozens of them that are active currently all across the globe, and they're built by partnerships through many nations. So through this, we can do things like observe the Earth and its vital signs. We can do positioning, and we can do communications. Another really important part of space technology is microgravity research. We can do a lot of fundamental science in space that helps us here on Earth and then technology transfer. So what we learn from space, we can apply di directly to our lives here on Earth and help improve our communities. So just how many satellite missions are there active right now? So this is a snapshot of just NASA's missions, not including organizations like the European Space Agency or private organization, and there are dozens of them. You can see really familiar things like the International Space Station, which is in orbit and houses astronauts 24 seven, and then other smaller missions that measure things like water, land use, and imaging for the Earth. One thing that I want to focus on is satellite Earth observation. So this is a really important part of the space technology. Through it, we can observe things that are happening here on Earth that are really important to our lives and livelihoods. So on the left here, you see images of a hurricane. This is actually Superstorm Sandy. So we can do a lot of things to protect human safety. There are also other kinds of sensors that we can put on our satellites in order to sense what is happening on the Earth. So for example, on the right, you see infrared sensors, and we can tell the temperature on a pretty uh, high scale throughout the Earth and track its changes over time. So an important concept behind this is remote sensing. And basically, you have an energy source, such as the sun, and it's reflected off of the things here on Earth. So for example, vegetation, and then those rays are scattered, and they're picked up by satellite sensors. So we can tell through our satellites and our missions, what exactly is happening here on Earth. And when we start to analyze that data, we see important patterns. There's 
two important questions that I think we can ask about space technology. So one, how does this help us in the present? How is it being used currently by communities and scientists and concerned citizens? And then two, in the future, what is this potential? So to address the first question, I want to introduce you guys briefly to my research project this summer. So we were looking specifically at a region in West Africa, in Benin, specifically the city of Cotonou, which is a rapidly urbanizing area. So looking at it through satellite lenses, what can we see? So in true color, this is what we would see if we were astronauts on the International Space Station, for example. Looking at it on the right is in false color. So here highlighted in red, you can see the vegetation. And it just helps us see a little bit more visually what exactly is happening here. And so in this research project, we wanted to know where are the invasive plant species in this community and how are they harming the livelihood and what can be done about it. So this is a, a method that we use called the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. So this is a little bit more quantitatively rigorous and it looks abstract when you first see it, but it's simple once you break it down. So red here is vegetation and in the middle in yellow you can see land and dead vegetation and then green is water. And so when we amass these images and we start to do time-lapse imagery, we can see important patterns that start to emerge. So this is looking at it in false color, or in true color, and then looking at it in NDVI. And so you can see here the vegetation, what is water, and what is just land. So the important thing that we start to see once we do time lapses, like for example, this is a time lapse in the winter from 2017 to about 2018. And so we can see important patterns start to emerge. You can see how the vegetation shifts through the months, and we can start to see how does this plant grow and how does it proliferate. So one place that we see is growth around infrastructure. What you see there is a bridge. So you see that this plant begins to amass under the bridge and it actually blocks traffic that goes under. Um, and this harms economic livelihood as well as people's general um, travel. We can also see that it begins to accumulate across the banks of a river. So this is a target area. If you're a community planner or an urban planner and you're trying to start to target this problem, this is an important thing for you to know. Also, a really uh, persistent problem about this specific plant is that it grows in these small tributaries. So it blocks the river. And then it also grows in these acacias, which are man-made fisheries, and it starts to amass there. So with satellite data, we want to increase the availability of near real-time and predictive information. One other project that I'm working on as a part of my senior thesis has to do with this satellite, NASA GRACE. What it is, there are two satellites that follow each other through the Earth, and they can sense the gravity changes very small throughout the Earth, and they can begin to quantify that. So what can we learn from gravity changes on Earth? Sounds like an abstract concept, but what is actually moving under it is water. That's the only thing that moves that significantly on the Earth. So we can see how water is changing um, on our planet over time. And this mission has been active since about 2002. So you can see areas of the world that are getting wetter and area of the world that is getting drier, specifically due to climate change. There's a lot of things about our water storage that we didn't know before these missions were active. So for example, groundwater is rapidly de depleting in many key aquifers along the globe. One very important one is in California. This is very close to home. This is an area that's been in the news recently for having a lot of wildfires and a lot of droughts. And during the times of drought, water is pumped intensely from under the ground. And before, we didn't know just how much that was. But you can see here the area that is highlighted in red. It's a significant amount. And you can even no notice that there's land subsidence, which means that the land is physically sinking because of the water that's being sucked out. And so one important thing that results from knowing all of this uh, information from satellite data is policy change. So in 2014, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act was packed, passed in California in order to address this problem. And there are many similar basins around the world that have similar problems. For example, in China, in India, and parts of the Middle East. So even though we've um, had a lot of progress and success with satellite technology, there's still significant barriers to access and use. One solution to that is CubeSats. So these are small satellites that are about 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. So that's about the size, half the size of a Rubik's Cube or a little bit bigger than the fuzzy dice that you see in people's mirrors. So these are very small but very sophisticated devices. And through it, you can see that 
people were beginning to experiment more with satellite missions. Before, this was the domain of specifically governments who had enough money to pump billions of dollars into satellite missions. But now you can have young college students, for example, or other people who are interested begin to make these in their own homes. Um, and if you can find the money to finance it, you can launch it to space as well. And so this is an important, important space for experimentation and for learning more about our planet and about the instrumentation that we send up. There's been a large increase in this uh, technology and its use. It's been very popular since it was introduced back in 1999. And you can see now up until 2015, there's about um, 150 that are launched into space each year. And in total, there's about 1,000 CubeSats in space. So this is, marks an important paradigm shift. No longer is space technology exclusive and the property of governments and large institutions. There's a commercialization of space that's underway now, and everyone can be a part of it for a lower cost and with more room for experimentation. Another really important part of space technology is technology transfer. So this is the process of taking things that have been useful to us in space and applying them to improving lives and livelihoods here on Earth. And NASA has a specific program for this that they call the, uh, the spin-off program, the NASA, NASA Technology Transfer Program, whereby you can take NASA's patents and actually use them to start your own business, and they will help you with that. So where has this been applied? So for example, in search and rescue, people have taken radar technology that before was used to make gravity maps of Mars, and now they use it to find people under the rubble, for example, in earthquakes or in war zones. There's water purification technology that was used for the astronauts aboard the International Space Station, and now it's used to purify water in rural areas and for people who don't have access to basic sanitation. It's even used to plate gold and make the Oscars shine brighter for Leonardo DiCaprio, who we know has been waiting a long time to get one. <laughs> and so an important question is, so what are we going to do with it to the future? And that's a question that all of us have to answer to together and that I'd like to pose to you as well. Because really, space technology and a quest for true justice and development and equality is a global goal, and it requires global participation. And so by continuing to democratize space and to increase people's access in it, we actually improve our chances of reaching the sustainable development goals that were set out for the world and agreed upon by all those countries. So I challenge everyone to think broader not only about space and space technology, but about your own fields and disciplines. Whether it's a technical field or something of another nature, there's something of value that each one of us can present and can give to society. And most of the innovation that happens tends to happen across disciplines and when we collaborate with each other and listen to each other's stories and problems and solutions. And with that, I say that the possibilities are truly limitless. Thank you.